All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody who is uh, joining us. Welcome to another one of the Wiser series. Uh, we are going to have a bit of a dig into what typically is a dry subject, but we have assembled a pretty freaking awesome fun panel, and we're going to inject hopefully a little bit of humor and a little bit of life into the wonderful world of policies, procedures, and controls, and uh, what the heck are we going to do to the darn things? So with that, I'm going to shut up because everybody knows me, and I'm going to let everybody else kind of start introducing themselves. I'll start with Renee, and uh, we'll work our way around Hi. the screen. <laughs> yep, you're All up. right. Um, um, I'm Renee Gunn, uh, Chief Business Operations Executive for um, an, an IT uh, services and consulting firm. And I love policies. I, I get to write HR policies, security policies, any kind of policy. Just love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, you're up. <laughs> yeah, jeez, I gotta follow that, huh? Um, <laughs> Alyssa Miller, I'm a hacker, a security researcher. I'm a security advocate for a company called Sneak. Um, I don't love policies, but I also very much understand the necessity and would like to see them done better, especially as they apply to things and say the DevSecOps world, and as we kind of move forward there, it's hard to say move forward for something that's eight year, or 12 years old, but yeah, you know, we're, we're still trying, so. Oh my gosh, nice one, yeah. I, the DevSecOps, I didn't even add it in there, but that's a huge one. We'll have to hit that one, definitely. I, hey, I should well, have a redo after Alyssa. That was pretty professional. <laughs> Dave, you're up. My name is Dave Hunley, and I'm a uh, risk analyst. And uh, I've done consulting. I worked for Chris for a number of years, and uh, realized that I'm actually like Renee. I'm one of the weirdos that really likes policy, <laughs> um, and realized that I'm better at policy than the uh, technical side of things. Um, so you know, do what you're good at. This is a guy who basically emails me every now and again or messages me and texts me every now and again and says, hey, I've consolidated this, this, and this policy into this centralized system, and I've done this, and, and I've, I've mapped it. To, and I'm like, okay, now you scare me. I mean, I, I, now it's scared. I mean, freaking amazing. We're using the templates that Dave created years ago. I mean, awesome. but it scares the hell yeah. out of me. But he's right, a Jeff. Developer. That's good. Yeah. Jeff, you're up, sir. Hi, I'm Jeff Mann. My uh, daytime job is I'm a consultant advisor for a pro services company called Online Business Systems. I mostly focus uh, on the PCI world, and I'm required to drink when I say PCI. Oh. Uh, my side job uh, and passion is I'm a host uh, and co-host on Security Weekly. Uh, I have my own show called Security and Compliance Weekly. Nice. Uh, curmudgeon, old timer, hacker, OG. Been doing this for god awful number of years at this point. Yeah. Gabrielle, last but not least. Uh... Yeah, I'm the founder of Wiser. Uh, we do uh, online safety training, uh, AKA security awareness. Um, we have this great vision that one day people will be able to browse the web without getting hacked. Uh, it will probably take time. And uh, yeah, policies is part of it. So I try to follow them. <sighs> All right, so we're gonna leap into this one because I, I had a little, a part of the reason for doing this one is I had a little bit of a rant, um, I like to do sometimes, online uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I said, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I said, I need two rooms. I said, one room I wanna put everybody who's responsible for the security for like Dominion, Heart, and ESNS in a room and not let them come out until we can actually get something that's maybe secure for elections. And in the other room, I want to put every single one of these bloody people who keeps coming up with a new set of policies or controls or frameworks that these poor companies that we're dealing with have to look at. You've now got companies like, well, hang on, do I have to do PCI? Do I do this? Do I do ISO? Do I do NIST? Do I do this? If I'm working with a company, do I fuck? Do I do? I feel pity for them. And then we have other people like, well, we're going to create a whole new set because there's not enough confusion in the marketplace. 
And I'm like, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we, if I'm running a business or if I'm doing this, how do we, can we consolidate it and how do we deal with this? So I kind of want some initial thoughts from everybody on, yeah, Jeff, you're up. Um, well, even before our initial thoughts, uh, if you would indulge me and our listening audience, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very big proponent of defining our terms. So at least for the purposes of our discussion here, could yeah. one person like you, Chris, define what you mean by a policy, a procedure, and a control? Yeah, totally. That's actually a really good point. So for me, if I look at it, and Dave's probably almost better than me. So let's take data handling, which is a perfect one because we're generating so much data in this world, we don't know what the hell we're doing with it, let's face it. So for me, a data handling policy is expressly laying down what it, what I want to be able to do, what it contains, what the framework is, what I'm dealing with. So what is the data handling policy is like, look, we as an organization have this type of data. The policy says we have to look after it. The procedure says here's how we look after it. Here's how we look after rest. Here's how we look after it in motion. Here's how we look after it when we've got it. And here's how we destroy it. And then the control is, all right, we've built this computer system. We've built these things. How do we put the checks and balances around that? Is it a technology solution? Is it a, a person on the door with a gun solution? Is it a mix of both? And then how do we put a tick in the box that when the audit team come in, that we can validate we're actually doing what we say we can do? So that's how I would break it down. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So I'm going to immediately throw a wrench in the works, maybe. Okay. Uh, in my in my training, in, uh, which is primarily DoD, mm -hmm. um, I I learned pretty much what you just described, but in a slightly different twist. I learned policies, standards, and procedures, where I would define policies as the goal or the objective. The standard is, you know. Here's the details of what you what you're going to have to do to meet your policy objective, and the procedure is then how you do it. So, you, yeah. um, you know, I, I said pretty much what you just said. I just happen to attribute the definitions to different terminology, and, and yeah. in particular, what you described as a uh, a procedure, I would describe as a standard, and what you described as a control. I would describe as a procedure. So uh, this is why I like us to define terms because we can have a lengthy conversation and we all think we're in agreement uh, and saying the same things about terminology and yet find out at some point, oh, when I said this, I meant this, but when you heard that, you were completely over there in another field. And of course you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> yeah, well, I proceed. Know. Yeah, and this is actually great because doesn't I mean this highlights already one of the problems we have when we start talking about policies, right? I mean, yeah. everybody's kind of got their predisposed ideas of what all these terminologies mean. And yeah, sometimes some organizations, whether you say policy standard, procedure, it means nothing. Others, it's very meaningful. And if two people have different definitions of it, that in and of itself is problematic. So yeah. it's actually really good you brought this up. Yeah. All right. So I, I, you know what? Go ahead, Chris, and then I'll see. Yeah. Actually, Alyssa, to your point in that case, because I don't want to be on the sides on things, but on your, when you're talking to companies, when you're dealing with stuff, especially on like the education on the DevSecOps and that side of it, how are you, how, where are you pulling your, how are you defining where you're coming from? And Renee and Dave, I want to ask the same thing as well. Yeah, so I mean, I honestly, what Jeff had described is kind of what I've always used as the terminology, but there are I told you I was times. right, Chris. <laughs> there are, there's a lot of times where I'm working with organizations where I can recognize pretty fast that like those terms don't have solid concrete meaning to them and yeah it is kind of a level set then um, of okay let, let's talk about how we're going to build this as a, a structure of we've got our policy and it, it's this high level thing we've got the standard which is this and then our procedures are that next step and I mean, I actually kind of put controls then are kind of even below that because controls are very very granular and specific to how that procedure gets implemented in a very specific context. So, you know, that's kind of the way I look at it. But, I, you know, it's not so much important that Jeff's right or Chris is right. What's <laughs> important is that we're all speaking that same language, whatever the definition is. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 would, um, I, I would agree with that 
uh, to Alyssa, not that I'm taking sides, but I, I resonated more being a chief business operations executive with uh, the terminology that Jeff presented because typically when people think of policies, they, they're they not just thinking of the um, the IT organization, they're mm. thinking of HR and other areas. And so when you look outside of IT, typically, not always, you hear, you know, standards, procedures, and you're less likely to hear controls. But if I look at the technical sense, I always hear controls. Yeah, which, is, which gets interesting. Again, I wonder if that's something, you know, we talk about us trying to translate our language into something the rest of the business understands. Dave, you're on the pointy end of this stuff as well. Give me your thoughts on this. And again, not a size thing, but how much confusion are you seeing on this side of the world as well? Um, very. Uh, but a lot of it is because, so I'm currently at Ibotta and I wrote our security policies. And part of the problem is when you're dealing with, say, the startup world, you've got a lot of organizations that haven't really thought this through yet. So, like, in a perfect world, the policy comes first, and then everything kind of flows out from that. But in the real world, they may already have standards they may already have guidelines they may already have procedures in place so you have to find a way to kind of uh, move the cart back to getting before the horse to kind of get them on board um i also think that explaining things to the business helps if we think about policy as a general rule as a driver for culture because culture is big for a lot of organizations. And if your policies are the driver of a corporate culture, then that becomes easier to get more of a top-down buy-in as opposed to bottom-up where everybody thinks security is just out to get them. Yeah. <laughs> we are. Just don't tell them that. Yeah. You know, sometimes but, you need the hammer. Sometimes you need the carrot. No, and, totally. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, and I think you need a carrot with the hammer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's important for... Um, you know, when we go across the business with policies too, you know, you have to help people to understand we're implementing them to solve a problem, right? We don't want people to access data if they shouldn't be accessing it, right? Don't, well, that's, okay, don't so, so, click so, on a yeah. link if you should. <laughs> what so were you going to say, Chris? One. Hang yeah. on, yeah, here's an interesting one on this one. And this is one of the questions that came in it feels uh, and this is this is where i kind of went on this bit of a rant the other week it feels like if i'm if i'm well we'll pick on you know jeff's here from pci so it feels if i have to adhere to pci i have one set of rules that i have to make sure that my policies procedures stuff all kind of adheres to at least aligns to to make sure i get that tick in the box again i'll put the business hat on i want my tick in the box if I'm working with the federal government, I'm like, okay, well, hang on, I've got PCI, but I've still got to deal with this, like, furky nerky kind of weird stuff. Um, oh, and by the way, because I'm doing healthcare, so let's take, I'm, I'm helping the VA, crap, i got to deal with all this high trust stuff as well. Um, oh, and because I'm operating in Europe, i got to deal with GDPR coming in here as well. Uh, which which one of these whole systems, how do we... How do we help an organization simplify that rainbow and that myriad of stuff down to something simple? Back to Rene, back to this, you know, I just want to look after my damn data properly. And I want a simple set of policies, controls, procedures, standards that does that, that I can actually send out to each one of these and go, I got your ass covered. May, may I suggest that you might be setting up a straw man conversation by implying that the goal is simple? Oh, I know it's not. I mean, that's that's where the challenge, and this is where my frustration is. We're not seeing forward motion in our industry. We're, uh, or We're not, and, 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 so and I think that there's uh, uh, several root causes for that, which we're, we're not going to have time to, to dissect all of it uh, today in this, and uh, but let's take a stab at a few of them. Um, yeah. I think it's important, uh, well, I, I wanted to comment on what David said about, you know, working for a startup and they don't have anything. I, you know, I work for clients that are very well-established companies that don't have anything either. Well, or sure. or what they have, they think is a useless paper-pushing exercise that they pull out once a year 
to satisfy the PCI auditor and yep. they don't put any context, they don't see any value, they don't know why. And I think part of the solving the problem, to touch on what Renee was saying, and I think David, you said it too, I think it's a cultural problem. At the end of the day, I think about where I grew up in security in the DOD, and as I look back and reflect on why, why did why did I have the impression that back then I worked for a secure organization, and whereas today I rarely see anything that I would describe as a secure organization, and the one thing that I keep coming back to is it was a culture. Uh, while I was young and naive and and didn't necessarily respect the rules that were in place that supported the policies that I'm sure existed somewhere. Um, everybody understood their role. Everybody understood their place. Everybody understood the importance of following the rules and how yeah. everything worked together for an overall objective of, you know, we're a, it, my first job yeah. was at a research organization for the Navy and they had secrets to protect and everybody was going to do their part to protect the secret. That largely and I blame myself as much as any of the other myriad security professionals that came out of the DOD, that's largely not translated well into the real world. And, and how do we fix that? I, I think at the end of the day, the fix is to understand the role and the place of all the things that we're talking about, because I could argue that policies and procedures and all the paper is extremely important, but at the same time, I could have a discussion and say nobody ever got hacked because they didn't have a, you know, blankety blank policy, fill in the well, blank policy. Yeah. Well, well, I think yeah, what you're highlighting is sure. actually what I see as a problem with security professionals in general, um, and that is so. Bear with me for a minute here on this. So, Chris, you had talked about this idea of you know from a business perspective, we think about you know, the, the compliance requirements that we've got from 45 different organizations that are coming in and are all giving us these regulatory things that we have to match up to. And so from the business perspective, that's how we think about it, because if we want to keep the doors open, we want to keep taking payments, we got to deal with PCI. If we want to keep working in the healthcare vertical, we have to address HIPAA and high tech and so on. And so that's how the business thinks of it. The culture that Jeff's talking about is a very security culture. And I think the disconnect here is, we, what we want, first of all, to kind of answer the original question you were asking, Chris, was we to simplify that, we need to start with that culture first, right? Like the things that we're doing from policies should be built to address the security first or and, and at a business level, because when you look at policies, those apply at the business level. And then it's when you get to standards and procedures, you get down to the te technology underneath. But you know, and then from there, you can matrix out all the requirements. You can show how your policies address them and do your gap analysis and say, okay, now we, we've failed to touch on any of our policies on this, but now they've all got the right focus and it's security. Now, the issue and why I say this is a problem with security people is when I'm a business person, if I'm a CIO or I'm a CEO and I'm looking at my business and I see all of these compliance requirements that threaten my business, and will stop me running tomorrow, they represent huge business risk and liability. So that's what I'm going to address. What we don't do a good job of from security's perspective is showing the business value of what our security initiatives mean, not in terms of, oh, we're gonna prevent these ethereal attacks from happening and these you know hypothetical situations where we could lose all this money or whatever. We don't actually show business value very well. And that's where I think we turn that tide. And I'm actually curious what Renee thinks about this too, because in the space you're in, I, I'm betting you've got some opinions here. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I've come from the payment space too, even though I'm in a different vertical right now. But yeah, I'm like going yes to uh, everything <laughs> you're saying. Um, I will say that I think there's definitely um, a, a culture challenge, but if you think about security professionals, what you just mentioned, Alyssa, I think they don't understand what's happening in other areas of the business. So there's not that alignment. So I think there's a culture issue, a strategy issue, a communications issue, but it's really around alignment. As um, a security professional that wants to roll out you know, a new policy, go to the business right so that you understand what they're trying to accomplish so that you know you're you're complementing what what 
you want to do versus what the business is trying to do with your policy. And it goes back to we're trying to solve a problem here. For if, if, if you go to biz dev, you say, we need this policy. We don't have this security policy in place. It's going to impact our clients, right? You go to marketing to say, if we don't have this policy, it's going to uh, impact our brand reputation. So I think you always have to go back to culture, strategy, and then have alignment. Well, I think once so. you start talking to the business more it gets you more into like for us it was explaining when we were building a program out of nothing it was explaining the things like the cto that the reason we're putting policies in place and the reason we're going to build standards around them and things like that is because those types of incidents or any types of incidents can affect availability which for an app maker is a hugely important thing yep. whereas with our operations officer we were doing we were making cases to him going more from the idea of what's the cost of a breach or loss of information under say ccpa and you know things like that so i think you have to understand where your different stakeholders pain points are and then yeah. leverage security starting with your policy starting with your program as a cultural thing to kind of address some of those pain points and to make things easier it's also easier to get buy in then it's easier to get buy-in when you're like, hey, this isn't just a random piece of paper that I'm handing out so that you can accept risk. Because I'm not gonna be the one pulled before a judge. That's never gonna happen to me on nine times out of 10 times. It will happen to you. But yeah. you know, if you phrase it like that, that's a bad way to go about doing it. Instead, you say, this is how it helps you codify practices and create document culture to be able to affect change within an organization. Right. Yeah, to uh, to follow on to what David's saying, uh, what what what's he what he's effectively saying is what I think is ultimately what we as security professionals have any hope of trying to influence our our customers and our our our, our uh, employers is what I would just lump under the category of education and awareness, but but not some stupid test or video you take you know mm -hmm. 20 minutes once a year but the ability to know the business well enough to put it into context what you're trying to accomplish what you see as a security objective to comment on what renee said uh in, in terms of the you know and i'm paraphrasing but security people they they come in saying you know the sky is falling there's all these problems and they struggle with putting that into a context that the business understand um it's a two-way street because i think also there's too many, and again, I think we have influenced this in a negative way, we as security profession, professionals. There's too much belief in the real world that security is somebody else's problem, somebody else within the organization. It should all be taken care of for me, whether it's done technologically, programmatically, or simply yeah. there's another team responsible for it. And that's where we get all these marketing slogans about simplifying, easing the burden, taking away the pain of security. We had an article that I posted on our news segment a couple of weeks ago on Paul Security Weekly that was talking about, you know, the sky is falling. I forget the exact you know topic, but it was some you know severe security problem. And their solution was this is why you need to make PCI go away. And so you need to buy our product to eliminate PCI. And I'm like, what? Um, so it's a two-way street and, and we that see the problem need to be the ones that solve the problem ultimately that's my belief and we do that as you know to echo what a lot of people have been saying by learning the language of the business but also learning the context of the business policies and standards and procedures make a whole lot of sense uh if you explain them well and, and yes. renee's touched on you know put it outside of a technology security context but beyond that put it beyond the context that you know security is everybody you know i i said security is every everybody's business it's a cultural thing but at the end of the day businesses in the in the commercial world exist for two reasons or they have two concerns from a risk perspective one the ability to earn revenue make money be in business and two, it's how much is it going to cost them to to be able to stay in business. 
everything that we talk about can be boiled down to, I would argue, into one of those two categories. So put security in everything you want to do and accomplish as a security practitioner, professional advisor, consultant, whatever, in the context of one of those two things for your customer or for your organization, and then let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. We'll that, uh, hang, on, hang on a second. Uh, this is, <laughs> I'm going to rein back controls for a wee second. <laughs> this is Good where... Luck, right? uh, yeah. <laughs> This is where, so I'll go back to what Alyssa was saying, because, I mean, she touched on it earlier, which is the DevSecOps side of the world. And this is where I think also the message needs to also come, not just from security folks. It needs to come from a number of different teams. It can't just be security walking and going, hey, we've all got responsibility. The thing I love, and I, I got a huge soft spot for the DevSecOps side of the world, is the fact that we walk shoulder to shoulder. It's security with operations, with development teams, with everybody else walking shoulder to shoulder going, hey, we're working on getting our shit together and singing with one voice. Now let's bring the rest of the business. You know, to Renee's point, to David's point, everything else, now let's bring the rest of the business along with one voice. Alyssa, I'm interested from your perspective and from your thoughts when we talk about the policies, controls, and all the other shenanigans, how have you seen that on your side of things with like the DevSecOps and has it helped things to actually walk with one more than one voice? Yeah, so I mean, from the DevSecOps world, I, I, I agree with you, first of all, that that's why I, I brought it up, it, is it's, it's putting everybody into that shared responsibility, right? Everybody's got the shared responsibility. I don't care if you're in business, if you're in dev, you're in ops, wherever you land, you have a shared responsibility for making sure our software gets delivered fast, making sure it's stable, and making sure it's secure. Everybody's responsible for that. So, so security, if you're gonna ask devs to be responsible for security, devs are asking you to be responsible for getting their stuff to production quick. And that's the thing that really, that, so building that culture, you know, it, it comes down to, I always, we hear the triad of people, process, technology, and I always say we forget the fourth one, which is governance, um, <laughs> because it does no good to put all, I mean, and when we talk DevSecOps, honestly, we become hyper focused on the technology, the tooling, we forget the other sides. But all of those have to work together, and you need the governance because if you're not measuring this and making sure that, you know, one, we're showing continuous improvement over time, we're getting better and better. Two, we're auditing to make sure that we're actually doing the things we say that we're going to be doing. That's where having the policies and everything comes into play. But the crucial thing here is when you think about it in terms of that, that quadrant, if you will, or that, that quad of those four items, is when they are all aligned, you make sure that your, your, your policies, your, your, which is basically your process, right, that that is supported by how you enable your people, it's supported with technology, and it's supporting your governance. And your governance is supporting the tools that you have to make sure that they're getting used, you know, and your technology supports the people. And so when you see them all interact like that, and they all, we, we mentioned alignment before, when all of that aligns together and you actually make sure that they each enable each other and they each provide something of value to each other, that's where now you get this culture. Now you know that, okay, I didn't just create this policy that the devs can't possibly follow because it's going to extend their deployment timeline by three days. Okay, good. Now we're doing the right things. And to Renee's point before about, you know, bring them into the conversation when you're writing a policy. Yeah, exactly. If I'm considering, it's not just policies. It's what about when I deploy a tool? Am I considering whether or not devs actually will use that tool or does it create new friction for them? And they can't. Yeah, that makes a huge amount of sense. Renee, you were going to pitch on a couple of those I, things. I, I, you know what? I wish I was sitting in the same room with Alyssa right now. I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> So, so I'm thinking PPTG, and I have to add the A in there, alignment, but um, everything that you're saying is correct because, uh, not that what anyone else is saying isn't, but it really is about bringing um, everyone across the business into the conversation because I think specifically when it comes to security policies, it's very siloed and isolated. And then one day you hear, here's the policy. And everybody is up in arms across the organization, blaming security, cursing so, security. I mean, really the compliance folks too. 
I'm hearing this well, is we need this is like a PR exercise. I mean, this is literally it, it's public relations, it's yes. outreach, yes. it's it's all. I mean, what's uh, there's another word I'm looking for. It's not yeah. marketing or PR. Yeah, it's, it's called the Jedi. I call it the Jedi I mean, mind trick. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, think about not not to talk about politics, but if you think about the rollout of public policy, there is yeah. a lot of lobbyists involved, and communication, and figuring out the strategy, right? So you can get it written, rolled out, and implemented. And I think we forget that internally and as we're trying to roll out security policies we're just on paper and and here it is and that's why you know Gabe you'll appreciate this why people keep clicking those links right because yeah. they don't understand the why well, you know that's what I mean? that Actually, rolling to, to, to Gabrielle's stuff which is very much a case of that's why I like hanging out doing this because a lot of the things from the wisest side is making that you know, the, making that PR case, one way of putting it, as to why we need to think about doing things in short, sharp bites. Yep. Um, That's, you know, it. so at the essence, the way I see this, you know, uh, policies drive human behavior change, right? Like we want to change the way people behave. And we have mm -hmm. to remember that behavior is a key thing here. So how do we communicate it with, you know, people? And did we create policies that are against human nature. If we did that, we can write anything we want in the policy, but if it's against human nature, it's gonna be hard to implement, even if it's the right policy. So we have mm -hmm. to find that balance of a policy that we can actually also implement, or are we willing to invest a lot in that behavior change? Because that may require you know, a lot of effort, but if everything is aligned, if we're willing to put the effort in, then um, it's fine. And one of the things that we did, for example, and we did a lot of small guides, sort of we made the policies like flip books. So instead of like huge amount of information, it was just easy for people, you know, like big titles. We were thinking about it in terms of how do we make this policy go viral almost? And I think to some extent we were successful. You know, we saw some of those guides, which are basically policies, uh, being, you know, pushed around on social media and people were sharing with them and happy and sharing it with their families because it wasn't, you know, tagged as policy. It was tagged as advice and it had personal benefit to people. So I think, you know, just to sort of emphasize that communication is very, very important and we have to think about ourselves like marketers when we yeah. want to execute those, um, to basically implement those policies. And that's sort of what, you know, we try to do at Wiser, um, sort of, you know, bundle them nicely with the bow okay. and, yeah. All right. Dave, I know you've been chomping a little bit for a while. And then, Jeff, I'll head at you up next, I promise. So, um, to uh, Gabrielle's point about uh, making it a little bit more digestible, what we did was we created uh, cheat sheets for a lot of our policies, like acceptable use, data classification, and they were just really colorful, basic stoplight protocol kind of things that people could use so that they didn't have to slog through the legalese that a policy is generally written in, um, because to a certain degree it has to be, because that's what you're going to be using HR to hold people accountable to. So we created cheat sheets to make it easier for people to just kind of grab the information they need and move on. So were those cheat sheet summaries, like th did they overlay to yeah. the policy? That's a yeah, great exactly. I exactly. Uh, I just took a lot of the information without the annoying language and just made it easier to deal with. Like what what is class one information from how we classify it? You know, what can you do with it? What can't you do with it? How do you protect it? That type of thing. I love that and idea. I love that nice relatively idea. That's successful. actually pretty freaking cool. Um, the other thing that we did was we took, instead of having one big long information security program policy that's a bunch of pages, you separate things out so that each policy is one or two pages long at most. It's easier to digest. And that also allows you to create a system where we were talking earlier about how do we make things easier. And the way that I found is things like when you've got, say, PCI and HIPAA or something like that, 
you can, it's easier to map multiple frameworks together if you're using smaller policies that you can then say, okay, acceptable use, we have to put this call out in for this piece, for this piece, we have to do this. And you can um, adjust things like when I write, I tend to do things like if I'm writing to say the NIST, right? What I'll do is I'll take the actual piece that it describes to, and I will put a footnote in the policy for it. So if an auditor is looking at it, they can see there's the footnote for this particular call out. It's and almost it like it easier UX. on them and it makes it yeah. easier on me. Hang on. It's, it's like... So I want to hit two things on this one quickly. We got one question that came in from the audience was, can any of the cheat sheets by way of an example be shared? So Dave, I'm going to hit you up afterwards on this one if you don't mind. Because yes, I, I can. Uh, I have to do probably some sanitization first. Yeah. But yeah, I don't mind doing that. And I'd send, love to. Uh, copy we need your name all over them, definitely. Jeff, you've been chomping at the bit. Go for it, sir. Yep, and I have comments on quite a few things, so bear with me. Uh, Go for it. Uh, first off, uh, you know, I commented that you know we needed another name for this PR campaign. I mentioned Art of the Jedi Mind Trick, which is a <laughs> talk workshop and, and training course that i've given it's essentially persuasive speech if you took the college speech class yeah. you're trying to convince people to buy something or you're trying to convince people to change their way of thinking their way of acting their behaviors so it really boils down to simply persuasive speech and and how do you do that effectively so that's item number one item number two um Gabriel, your your comment about uh, we want to do things that don't go against human nature or are the things that we're doing going against human nature, I, I would purport to you that security goes against human nature. We are lazy. We want to not have to think about things. We, we want to not have to take extra steps. We just want to get our damn job done and be done with it. That's why we expect that security is somebody else's problem and it's taken care of for us. Related to that, the, the irony of the cheat sheet, PCI gets blasted all the time for being a checkbox compliance assessment. It's not real. It's not meaningful. It's just a, it's just a checkbox list. And yet you're promoting, I'm not saying right or wrong, you're promoting the idea of simplifying things with a cheat sheet. Uh, to me, that is that is more human nature, to tie back to what Gabriel said, because we as, a, as humans, we don't want to have to think through things and make value judgments and make the right decisions. We are much more happy. Just tell us what to do. Just give us the list of things. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the other analogy that I make on this topic very often is in the form of religion. Pick your religious persuasion. And, and their dogma, their, their theology, their doctrine, it's all a series of cheat sheets. Tell me what's acceptable behavior and so I can fit within the rules and, and, and be good, whatever good is, whatever your, your religious persuasion is. Um, and, and to your earlier question, my final point, Chris, you asked how do, how, you, know, you, you have an organization that has to do PCI and HIPAA and NERCFERC and all these other things. I would simply say, start with PCI because it's all there yeah it's it's hard to and it's also all right argue me this one mm -hmm. i want to say it's been there the longest but i'm debating which one has been there almost the longest it's definitely one of the early adopters Elissa, um renee anybody got any thoughts on this one dave i think it's one of the earliest ones what pci pci has yeah. been around since 2000 yeah I, I i would say that that that's what foundationally made me realize wait a minute I'm in security because <laughs> so, I had all this payment security PCI background. Yeah. See, it, it, it's funny for me. I have a really interesting view of PCI because I was working in fintech when PCI started to get teeth. Right. It showed up 2004, 2006. They finally they finally said, okay, yeah, we're actually going to start like enforcing this thing. Mm. And you know, I was in an organization where we were already doing a lot of the right things. And you know we had pen tests, we had policies around how often pen tests had to occur. We had controls because we were matching up to NIST. You know we had all this stuff in place. And so when PCI came, it was initially very high level and not very prescriptive at all. And so it was kind of checkboxy. And what made it worse was 
quite bluntly, because I worked with at least two of them, you had these PCI vendors who were just very, how do I put this? They weren't very scrupulous. Let me just be blunt. <coughs> Trust wave. <coughs> Trust wave. I didn't say that name, but that may very well have been one of the two. Hey, Harlan. Um, but, no. you know, yeah, I mean, you could, the, the most infamous words coming from a QSA's mouth that you knew you, you had your, your kind of get out of jail free card was when they would say the words, the intent of the requirement. Yeah. And they said that for years. And then finally, PCI was like, okay, y'all are going to go with this. We're going to tell you what the intent is. Yeah. They published a whole other set of information around the policy that gave you, this is why this requirement exists. So don't tell us that you're meeting the intent and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I think that that's what happened early with PCI was that people saw that. Now it's gotten more and more prescriptive since, and I think it's gotten better refinement PCI Council, for their part, has been more interested in collecting wider feedback and implementing that than they were initially. Um, yeah. You know, it was very much a very exclusive club when they started, and now they've, they've really opened up and have, have, have yeah. to their credit, taken a lot yeah. of the feedback that they got and yeah. implemented that. Quick, quick question, Alyssa. Too, I think sorry. they got harder on, you know, fintech payment processors around PCI compliance. I don't know what you think about that, Jeff. <laughs> well, it, uh, one of the greatest ironies of PCI is that uh, the banks, that, that either the acquiring or the issuing banks, the issuers of the credit cards, or the banks of the retailers, the merchants, the acquiring banks, none of them have to be PCI compliant. Now, they will say that they have to be PCI compliant, and it says in writing that they are supposed to be PCI compliant, but the, the loophole is they're not on the hook. Nobody is checking their compliance. And so that's okay. the big loophole. Uh, I had a quick question for cool. Alyssa though, because uh, I have I have huge arguments with people all the time on whether PCI is prescriptive or not prescriptive. I hold to it's not prescriptive. It gives you a, a lot of latitude, but I'm intrigued because you, you said that uh, what PCI added over the years was document documentation or explanation of the intent of the requirements and 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 what i heard at least and this is what i'm asking you to clarify is that that translated to pci is now more prescriptive because it actually says what the intent of the requirement is is that what you meant or in, yeah in i mean I mean, effectively, yeah, because I mean, sure, did it kind of enable now that people could say that things that weren't said in the requirements because the intent was this, but the problem was that was already occurring anyway, and it was being interpreted way too widely, in my opinion, and you you, you coughed out a vendor that was one of the ones infamous for doing that, um, and one that we used who did that, and I mean, I watched our risk management team manipulate that QSA and, and do that. And mm -hmm. I think when PCI started to say, no, this is the intent, it gave some guardrails because the other yeah. side of PCI was that there were certain requirements that were way too too Stringent. strict, yeah. too, too yeah. defined. Because like I said, mm -hmm. we were an organization who was already doing a lot of these things, but because of the way that PCI put their, their requirements down to match up to them, we had to actually like, to match that we either had to justify that we were doing the same thing just in a different way or we had to change what we were doing to match even though we were already doing the right thing so i mm -hmm. think it's there's a little bit of each there um which i know is like total fence writing answer all the way but uh <laughs> but no but that's the reality is i mean I, I think yeah they they did maybe become less prescriptive in like some sense if you just look at it very objectively but I think in the context of what people were already doing and what QSAs were doing because of the issues there, um, you know, it, it actually became more prescriptive by putting those intents in there and, and documenting that because now it, it set some guardrails that a QSA couldn't, couldn't push outside of. Well, uh, thank you for that. And, and, and it's funny that you express it that way because over the years, as I and I've been involved with PCI since before PCI, uh, and I actually, full disclosure, used to work for Trustwave, uh, which oh. is why I can disparage it. Uh, and I've seen too many Trustwave rocks at, at customers, especially breached customers that I was cleaning up after. But then I was standing. Um, 
I, I've always found it fascinating that as as PCI re, uh, evolved and, and new revisions came out, which as you describe, a lot of times they were just putting the in writing what the intent was. It, it, to me, it was always very consistent with how I interpreted uh, the, the requirements. Which not to, I'm not pointing at me. I'm 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 saying they clarified the right way to interpret it, which is the way I was interpreting it. Yes, there's always been a lot of latitude for people to interpret it differently. Um, stay tuned. Version four uh, is is promised to come out probably early Q2 next year, and uh, it's it's in some ways continuing the tradition what what we've just described of continuing to clarify, reorganizing and re-emphasizing. But they're 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 going to make it more prescriptive in the sense of things that were customarily the way you met requirements are now re going to be requirements. And I'm not allowed to get into details. I'm, uh, you know, there's a, a gag order right. on QSAs. But stay tuned. Okay. We have about 10 minutes left. You will take a minute or two. Um, we have some questions we've definitely hit from the audience and a bunch of questions that I want to hit in the audience in short, rapid fire answers, please. So, uh, let's start with the easy, let's start with some of the easy ones. Um, Renee, I'm going to hit you with this one if you don't mind. Uh, company leadership, defining their risk appetite. How do we help a company and organization define their risk appetite, understand it, and then translate that into those documentation side of it? Thoughts from Renee and then thoughts from Melissa, and then I'll hit the other guys on everything else. So you're talking bit. about the C-suite. Yep. Um, and so is that specific to like there's a security um, policy? Rapid fire questions. In general. Okay, I'm sorry. So <laughs> okay. to, to understand their risk appetite, it, you, you just always, I don't know if this will be specifically clear, you got to understand, okay, what's the impact in a specific area, right? So the C-suite doesn't look broadly. They look at different areas. What's the impact on biz dev? And if it's not a major impact, they're good to go, right? If it's going to cool. be disruptive to clients, their risk appetite isn't always high. Nice. Alyssa, you're up on that one. Yeah, I was actually going to say that to a large degree, when you're a security person coming in, risk appetite is almost irrelevant because if you are doing what I said before and you're tying your initiative to a business value you're showing value from what you're going to do it's not about risk appetite anymore it's about hey i'm going to enable this new thing if you can you know if we can make this security initiative happen nice okay so that's a good one all right so uh let's have a look what's the panelists thoughts on user development of a common control framework with them little 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 you guys all right we're gonna hold this one too much of a question keep it simple <laughs> stupid um 42 yeah, exactly yeah all right so this is a good one is hr a policy owner of security policies like acceptable use who owns the policies uh david and jeff i'm hitting you both with this one um in our case security owns the security policies but we uh assist hr in theirs um cool jeff what you got yeah i would say typically policies are controlled not even from security. Uh, I, I've seen more often like a compliance group or GRC yeah. group. Mm -hmm. I think accountability is different from ownership. And I think accountability- Totally like that one. All right, so here's a different question. Renee and Alyssa, um, small to medium business where we don't necessarily have a compliance officer and a CISO and all the other shit. Who owns it? Who owns the policy? And then I'm gonna throw the Jeff one. Who owns the, the oh shit moment? So, um... Uh, oh, let's see, you want to go? No, you go first and then I'll go. Yeah, so I would say, honestly, it's got to be someone in the C suite and it, it's got to be not HR because really the way I look at policies is policies apply across the organization. Standards that fall under them might be owned by security. This is how we achieve this policy with our security standard. Here's how HR standards achieve that same policy, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say it's definitely the C-suite and it's the operations leader. So that's typically okay. who's gonna, Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I like that one. In a you know small to medium-sized company. So if I look at my company, I own it. 
and I'm business operation. All right, next question. All right, and I like this one. As, aside from the answer is talk to Dave, which is actually a really good answer. Um, where can we get a good template of policies and cheat sheets? We know that's a talk to Dave. Where can we get good templates of policies mentioned in the conversation? Um, actually, I want, again, 30 seconds from everybody. Um, I want everybody's thoughts on this one. Jeff, you're up first on this one. Gosh, don't tell it's Elisa that I said this, but uh, I would start with a government resource such as NIST. I gotta be honest, that's where I was going with this one. I wanna see where everybody else's thoughts on that. All right, that's yours. I'm kind of in the same boat as you, although honestly for me, I'm just gonna go to Dave. Well, I, I should qualify that. How about the Orange Book? Ooh, not had that brought up in a long time. All right, <laughs> this is why I love you. You're awesome. Alyssa, <laughs> you're up. I mean, I, I'm still recovering from the PTSD from mention of the Orange Book, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> But no, I, I think there's NIST and there's actually a number of working groups around NIST that I think can help you with this. Um, because yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. Like I, I love the work that NIST is doing on this and I hate to just ride on the coattails, but I, I think they've done some really terrific work in the last five years in particular around this space. And that's where I would start if it was me. Cool, Renee. Okay, so I'm going to jump on the NIST bandwagon too, but I'm going to have an add-on um, because when I'm looking at, um, you know, policy examples or standards, I go to Australia. Oh, ah, 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 I'm not near yeah. I the, know. The, very, the one very country that's like, hey, we love your encryption, but we want to back go to it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Everything but that. And they got spiders and shit. I don't like their stuff. All right. <laughs> Moving on. David, I'm just going to go to you. Where the hell um, do you go so, to? So NIST is definitely one of them. The other one is I'm a sucker for books. I was looking. I'm, move, I'm in the middle of moving. So I was seeing if I still had it lying around, but I apparently don't. must be packed already. But I have a book called, uh, uh, basically, it's called The Practitioner's Reference for pragmatic security policies. Ooh. And uh, I am a not going to lie, a lot of my stuff is uh, blatantly lifted piece by piece from those where I need it. Like that's where I got the idea to put a call out to the specific part of a standard that you're adhering to in the policy seat that references it. And then that also allowed me to create a policy matrix that then referenced everything we're trying to do and told you where it was, what policy, so that conversations with people who don't live inside policies are way easier to deal with because they can just look at the policy matrix. Hey, if I may, Chris, I want to, I sure. again, this goes back to our definitions of terminology because in my mind, policies are, are very short to the point bullet point documents. We're going to do security. We're going to do it this, 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 and this way. The real art comes not into, in my opinion, not writing a policy uh, and use NIST as a reference for coverage and breadth. But the real art form comes in terms of the standards. It's the details. What, what are we going to apply and to what degree to our organization? And then subsequently the procedures. And procedures, I would argue, people are doing them. They just don't always have them written down. And so there it's not even as much creativity as as much as, you know, observe it. You know, and I do this all the time as a consultant observe operations, show me what you do, and let's break it down into steps that are translatable into procedure, because guess what? You need to have a documented procedure. So well, Jeff, the standards, I avoid writing with, like the plan. Um, do you see that with small companies too, or with the big guys where they're already following the procedures? Because when I've gone into um, smaller operations, not mm -hmm. seeing Well, ev everybody's, in business and conducting business, they're all executing procedures. The issue is whether they're written down or not. The bigger companies tend to have been doing compliance longer and then they have it all written down, whereas the smaller companies, especially in the PCI world, they don't get the love and attention that the big companies do. So they don't have to do it, so they don't do it which again is back to the human nature thing. If you don't have to do it, you're not gonna do it. And security by definition, I think is against the grain of human nature. If I don't have to do it, I don't wanna do it. 
So yeah. this comes back to this comes back to we, we really almost have to start this as a I mean it's an education thing hence the reason the logic we've got Paul Gabriel's been sitting there all quiet on this one but this is the logic that we're running this from Wiser Training because the logic is like okay what can we do to almost help promote to do the PR around this to do some education some awareness some look we're not doing this just for the sake of it we're doing it to actually help everybody. That to me is the one. Hey, Dave, I just pinged you in this in the messaging. Can we get that book title again? Do me a favor, shoot it out, and I'll put it out as a response to this one. All right, so I've got one set of final questions before we end up wrapping this one up. We've talked a ton, and I'm really appreciative to everybody, by the way. Thank you. We've talked a ton about like how to build it, how to do to it, how to how to put stuff in place. A couple of questions have come up. How do we measure? the effectiveness and I we could take another hour on this and we have about three minutes how do we measure the effect how do we help companies understand the effectiveness or measure the effectiveness all right I'm gonna go somewhat in a reverse order so actually I'm not I'm gonna go over here Alyssa you're up first on this one because you I got the best reaction from you <laughs> <laughs> well that's because I'm gonna put in a shameless plug I'm actually uh, next week releasing a white paper on exactly this topic uh, measuring your security program and so just I really quick, because I could talk, like you said, for an hour on this. Go for it. Um, the, the key is making sure that you really look at what data you're able to collect today, how that data interrelates. Because see, we tend to get focused on one data point as a metric, and we set arbitrary standards. We don't look at how they interrelate. Like, okay, my number of vulnerabilities went up, but is that because I did 50,000 commits this month instead of 40,000? Um, you know, things like that. And then if you do it from that way and you build it from the ground up instead of the top down, and then you examine those relationships and you build your metrics and KPIs off of that, now you have ensured that you have business context because you're not building it off of things you don't have or things that were set arbitrarily, but you're doing it off of here's what we have and here's how we make sure it continues to get better rather than trying to achieve this one arbitrary you know, number that we're trying to hit. Oh, that's awesome. That's freaking, I want to see that white paper one. I'd love to, I'm assuming it's going to get blasted over LinkedIn and announced. Oh, yeah, and stuff. Be LinkedIn, Good. Twitter, everywhere. So. All right, Renee, and then Jeff, you're up, and then Dave, I got you on this yeah, one. That, that's, that's a hard one to follow, but um, from an operational standpoint, so I do like data, so I would encourage people to look at the areas that you think you need to transform and then get the data around that. So that's looking at, okay, who's been clicking on things they shouldn't, right? What have your, what, what's your baseline for incident response issues and who's accessing areas that they shouldn't, right? And you just yeah. get that baseline data, right? And then you roll out your policy right and you figure out okay we want it to yep. go from here to here 40 percent no. increase 30 percent whatever but i'd say pick a, a, a few good rocks don't try to do everything at once yeah that's a really good point i love that one this is i i i'll give a plug because we do the shit show on thursday nights with um with the guys with evan and ryan from security studio so i love the stuff that they're building out on that side of things again it's a numeric value that you just plug into stuff totally awesome jeff what you got for us sir on this one short short answer is that's what compliance programs are for they are measuring sticks ultimately my somewhat more philosophical answer is i think of the sean connery character in the movie the untouchables and and i i wish i had the quote memorized but when he's talking to uh uh, Elliot Ness and Elliot Ness is all depressed and he's like like did you come home alive today it was a good day yeah. that's how you measure the success of your security program that's a really freaking yeah that was yeah nice one that's awesome David what you got so I've never I haven't been the one to measure the success too much I'm usually the one who writes stuff so I was like there you go um but speaking of another book, there's a one that's called How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity Risk Ooh, that I think yeah. might be helpful for people to get ideas. Because I'm a big fan of mooching off of other people's hard work and using it to make my own work better. So yeah. are most developers, but go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, it's just like when you're doing job interviews for things and if they ask you, 
you know, let's say you run into something you've never seen before, what do you do? If the answer does not include the word Google, then you're not thinking about the problem correctly. Well, okay, so I am not the like, only person who's had a problem writing a policy. <laughs> this is my thing that's driven me nuts on this one, having, and this is why I wanted to do this. And we came to some really nice kind of thoughts and ideas. I'm fed up of everybody going off and building their own freaking fief fiefdoms or fiefdoms. Everybody plants their flag and says, well, I've got this new, no bullshit to that. Take something that people have done effectively and build off of it. Help everybody grow rather than building your own sodding fiefdom. This is what's driven me nuts. All right, we have hit the top of the hour and more. And um, I, I found the every, quote, parting thought. It? Go for it. You just fulfilled the first rule of law enforcement, insert cybersecurity program. Make sure when your shift is over, you go home alive. Yeah, that's it. I like yeah. that one. Gabrielle, any final thoughts on this one before we say thank you to everybody? Um, I think, you know, first of all, it was a great uh, session. I think, you know, so much input. And we're going to follow up this webinar with um, a blog post of, you know, summary of the things we spoke about. I hope uh, David can uh, share with us a summary of those cheat sheets so we can also include that. But uh, it was a great discussion. And I think, you know, we all benefited from it. Yeah, I I ridiculously appreciative of everybody being on this one. Please, and this is a reminder, please look out for a message from Jen. Um, I want to address this from everybody and some other things. Um, we're starting to do some fun stuff. So with that said, um, Alyssa, Renee, Jeff, David, Gabrielle, thank you so very, very much for being on this. To everybody who's listening, thank you very much for listening. And, uh, gratefully 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 appreciated you can find everybody who's been amazing on this panel up on linkedin and everywhere else and feel free i assume to hit them all up please do that there's a crazy amount of information here so with that we're going to say thank you very much and goodbye um closing thank yous and goodbyes from everybody please bye, bye. bye. happy this holidays yes you, wear a Thanks damn mask <laughs> <laughs> take care and goodbye all right bye bye, bye.